Okay, great. Right, okay, just um, firstly to introduce myself, uh, as it says, Mike Reese, um, general manager up here at uh, Corsair Marine. Um, so, for, for clarity, see when Catamarans purchased Corsair Marine back in 2010. Um, it's the manufacturing division we have, um, but it's as a, a business here in Vietnam, we're still very much Australian owned. Uh, Richard Ward's still the business owner, and uh, we've got a, a high contingent of Australian expats as well as a, uh, a few others that we've uh, got. We've got some UK boat builder who's a composite specialist. We've got a, um, a Canadian fit out specialist as well. So we've got a bit of a mix, but still very much got the core of the Seawin team that was based in Australia. Myself, I've been working for Seawin Catamarans for 10 years, having um, joined the company as a production engineer and then going on to production manager in Australia and then um, to general manager coming here to Vietnam uh, two and a half years ago. Okay. So, um, Brent, if you just want to click to the next slide, we are obviously wanting to run through the the details on the 1190, um, which is a, a great new project we, we, uh, we've we taken on up here and we're um, getting towards the final stages of the first product um, being launched. Uh, in April, we'll launch the first boat. We've got a, a second boat in build coming through as well, um, both of which are going to the US market. Um, but it's a good opportunity now to, to really run through some of the the, the, the concept of the boat and um, and really what we're trying to deliver to the market with this new model. Okay, so it's it's very much um, it's a, it's an interesting product for us. We've been producing the 1160 for a number of years, and we've often had uh, requests and comments for um, for a more performance orientated product and and. What we're trying to deliver with this is the product that's it still has uh, still retains some of the the, the fantastic comfort and, and cruising um, components of a of a seaman catamaran. However, we're really um, we're trying to deliver to a, a a sailor or a buyer who is really wanting to be able to tick some other boxes as well in terms of performance. Um, so we've still got that great livability. That you have on an 1160. We've still got the, you know, the fantastic entertainment space uh, in the saloon area with the with the large opening trifold doors going into the cockpit. So you've got that livability, um, good seaworthy boat, just like our all the boats that we produce at Seawind. Um, and we've got the the dual helm arrangement, which suits this performance model um, particularly well. But then we've we've Got these performance features, which are really um, making this boat going to be a, a product that we we set out with our brief to say, well, we want to be able to outperform any um, any of the, the big production yards in terms of catamarans who almost always have the uh, the mini keel arrangement. And when you look at you know especially the bigger um, production yards, they are. Um, they're catering for the charter market, whereby you'd, you'd never want to have dagger boards and rudder style, um, uh, uh, dagger style rudders on board a boat. So, um, so we've got a number of different aspects which put this into a boat, which is it's going to be typically for someone that's a an experienced sailor, um, someone that's looking for a bit more performance and probably knows what they're looking for a lot more than your than perhaps some of the typical. Um, sea wind 1160 buyers, or, or just the the, the multi hull market in general. Okay. Um, the other thing that this product does, as well as doing um, obviously the, the performance aspect, it's it's also opens up to people that are looking to do cruising in, in different areas. Um, the shallow draft aspect of having dagger boards and and rudders that you can bring up for some people are, are particularly interesting and certainly uh, one of our customers in the US uh, has an area of cruising that they want to do where there's a lot of shallow water cruising um, that he's interested to do so okay so 
if uh, Brent, if you can just move on. The, um, the, 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 the main um, buyer for this product though is someone that's probably going to be doing regatta sailing and uh, or your weekend sailing, um, trying to get a bit more performance, doing a, a mix of, uh, of perhaps racing um, on the weekend, but also um, being able to cruise with that, um, but doing it, you know, doing your A to B point much faster than a, than a, a mini kill boat or perhaps a standard 1160. Um, we can just move on to the next slide. Brent. So when we're, um, uh, okay, sorry, I'm just reading the, uh, the screen there and we've got a, a note saying no sound for Brad. Okay, Brent, the screen is not advancing. Presentation is not changing. Right. Uh, stand by. So, Brent, what I can see, just for your info, is the working document in PowerPoint with notes to the base. That's a bit better. All right. Okay. All right, so we should be right with presentation-wise. Not sure about the sound, though. Um, okay. Can you all hear me? <laughs> Can you all hear me now? Okay. I think hopefully... The slides should now be changing for you. Yeah, okay. Back on track. Okay, slide has changed. Brent, Shane is actually not able to um, log on here. I wonder whether other people are in the same situation. So if you want to have a look at that. Can you just go um, back a few slides, please? Uh, back, back one slide, please. So, ah, okay. That's... Perhaps that's actually okay, that slide. <clears throat> okay, just um, just talking about design and um, and some of the technical details. So when we've we've looked at this, the brief of what we're trying to do and who we're trying to deliver to, we've then um, uh, introduced a couple of people to the project um, to look at the design aspect. Quite. Critically, we need to focus on getting good experience, good knowledge, working on the balance of the boat um, and the, uh, the, the rig and sail plan. So we actually decided to go with, with two um, designers working in conjunction. Firstly, we went to Al Cowardine, who is certainly one of the, um, the, the well-known and leading multi-hull designers in Australia. He um, has his own brand, Asia Catamarans, that he produces up in Phuket. But from that, he's got a number of boats that he can put his name on. I mean, uh, Cut Snake is certainly a very well-known boat, having done the, what, been and won the Brisbane to Gladstone and done a whole range of different events. He, um, Alan was used to work through the concept, um, work out the sail area, um, the, and really work out the, the power requirements for this to be a, a performer, because that's what he specialises in. But then we brought in to do, actually do the, the engineering, the laminates, and, uh, and, and use some of the, the high tech sort of hydrodynamic analysis was, the, uh, was Francois Perouse, who's one of the upcoming um, emerging naval architects and designers coming out of Europe. We, uh, we used Francois to design our uh, small trimaran that we've been uh, introducing in the last 12 months, the, the Pulse 600. Um, and we found him very, very good to work with, very switched on guy. He also um, was the designer of the, the Slider 47 and, and 57, a, a, a German built 
uh, catamaran that's certainly getting a lot of attention. And he, uh, he's been an integral part to, to working through the, the, the balance and the design and, the, as I say, the, the structural components of this product. So with these two guys on board, we, um, we feel like we've got a, a good result um, to date in terms of setting the boat up right. Um, okay, Brent, um, so, well, we're on to the next slide. So the power to weight ratios, as you guys will see from the um, demonstrated uh, uh, table here, we've got a, um, we have got a taller rig and we'll come to that later on, but when you, when you look at the fact that the um, 1190 Sport is lighter as a product itself, its displacement is half a tonne lighter than the 1160 light, but then you can see we have got some additional main um, uh, but the, the real gain is actually in the jib. Um, so we've powered up by having a taller rig. We've moved the forestay proportionately higher as well. Um, and then we've actually um, got a, a significantly larger um, sail area to the 1160 light. So our power to weight ratio, it's demonstrated there in a bit of a funny number, but 90 over six ton versus the 77 over six and a half ton, we're obviously going to be significantly more powered up. And we'll, as I say, we'll come back to the rig a bit later about how we uh, how we deal with that. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Brent. Okay, just just to flip through a couple of the things. I mean, the the one of the um. The important and significant changes is going to the going to the dagger boards and the dagger style rudders, um, really um, changing the the sailing performance of a boat dramatically when you do that. The the major benefit when you go to the the daggers dagger boards is the pointing ability. Um, you know, with a sea wind 1160, 1250, the sweet spot when you when you um, powered up, you're sailing about sort of 40 degrees, maybe, you know, 38, 40 degrees is where you can really say you're, you're in the, the sweet spot. So when you go to dagger boards, we're going to be dropping that down by five, six degrees, something like that. So we should be looking in the range of 33 to 35 degrees of the wind um, as being a, 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 an angle that we're going to be able to sail still powered up without, um, without pinching. So and that comes out of um, obviously the, the the change in in these boards. So you can see here we've got uh, a bit of a construction drawing coming through from Francois. Um, it's a bit of a technical drawing, but as you see, essentially what what's being demonstrated here is that we've got a, a series of carbon unidirectionals running down the centre of the board, and then you can see some some cross uh, support where the uh, where the bearings are. So it's got a an e it's a combination of Double bias e glass as the covering, but then with uh, carbon unidirectional reinforcement. Um, as with any dagger board, it, it needs to withstand serious load, um, not only from the the sailing aspect, but obviously it, it needs to be able to take a uh, you know, a slight amount of impact, or uh, if if needed, we it can't be it can't be too soft. Um, in terms of doing dagger boards, this is something that we we've got good experience with through Corsair. We've got um, all of the Corsairs have got um, dagger boards. We, the smaller boats have got some aluminium versions, but, but all of the bigger boats have got composite dagger boards. So this type of constructions, um, whilst being new to the sea wind range, is certainly not new to our production shop here in, in Vietnam. Okay, Brent, if you can go to the next slide. <coughs> so this is a... Um, 3D model of the, the dagger board um, uh, in situ with the bearings. Um, that, this drawing is actually slightly older. The the mid bearing there, or the, well, it's actually the top bearing, which is at the midpoint of the dagger board, actually sits below that um, that pulley system. So, but the concept can be demonstrated. You've got it's a um, it's a Delron type bearing, both top and bottom. The dagger board fits within the the height of the deck to hull, so it's all contained. So as demonstrated there, when the dagger board's actually in the up position, it's not protruding uh, through the deck, it's all below deck. And um, and then once in the lowered position, you've got 
probably about 70% of the board out of the hull and the 30% retained uh, with the bearing system um, taken below. Okay, so it's it's set up with a dual line, both running back to the um, to the cockpit. Um, so you've got an up and a down line with uh, with jammers, and you can turn that round onto a onto a winch. Okay, next slide. Just a this is just a, a close up uh, of the 3D model of the the lifting mechanism, so you can see where those those turning blocks um, then run back and aft to the to the, to the cockpit. Here is a, um, a shot we just took this morning. Actually, the guys have just got the first board uh, made, and you can see um, it's obviously quite a—it's a slender um, uh, board. The leading edge to left is is fairly fine. Um, uh, so this is, you know, the, the drag on this board is is uh, is not going to be significant at all. Okay, next slide. This is the um, the profile of the uh, of the dagger style rudder. Um, and a, a similar construction method. It's a it's a e glass double bias skin with a with an amount of carbon unidirectional running down it. And you can actually see at the bottom of the screen where uh, you've got the orange uh, material. That's it's actually a foam stringer that runs down where the unis are, um, bringing the two uh, parts together. So it's a it's actually an H section going down the center where they've joined and now those um rudders and the dagger boards are all glass taped on the leading and trailing edges okay obviously it's a it's a very high aspect um shape as you can see in the in the 3d model there. next slide just want to demonstrate some some numbers looking at the standard 1160 of which these this is the keel and the the, the rudder. Um, we've got fairly significant wetted surface area, 8.1 square meters um, over, that's that's for the total boat. So you can see you've got, uh, for a rudder, you've got nearly a square meter per rudder. And then for the keel is 3.1 each. So 8.1 square meters of total wetted surface area. If you can just go on to the next slide, you'll see the new Dagger board is only 1.5 square meters per side, and then the uh, rudder is only 0.44. So, if you go on the basis of going upwind, you're going to have one board, two rudders. You're looking at 2.4 square meters total. So, you've actually got a reduction of 5.7 square meters of wetted surface area upwind. Downwind, you'd bring the uh, the second board up, and you're looking at a reduction of 7.2 square meters wetted surface area reduction. So someone smarter than me, like Francois Rao, would be able to tell you what that equates to in boat speed. But um, but, but, but I'll, I'll just go for, we'll call it a, a knot or two. But anyway, it's it, I think we all understand uh, that that sort of sur wetted surface area, when you're talking uh, anti-fouled, uh, below waterline area, is significant in your boat speed, certainly. Just this, uh, the image we've got here is um, is just showing the the, the layouts, obviously, of the of the the dagger board and the rudder. It's um it's the the rudder case is transom hung. Um, it's actually it's not easy to see in this image, but it's the rudder case is recessed, so it's not all uh, hanging off the back. It's um, we've got a, a, a new moulding on the transom of the boat. And it's recessed in for protection. Um, so, um, but you can also see from this if you've got the rudder up and the dagger board up, you've got a very reduced um, draft. So I think our draft was uh, 0.6 um, with all boards up and 2.2 with the board fully extended. Um, so significant. I noticed on the chat uh, comment um, before. Uh, somebody was saying that the, uh, you know, having beaching a cap is fantastic, but you know, a bit of concern about being able to ground it. The laminate has been reinforced to compensate that, so we haven't just. Um, it's not just a case of, you know, cut a couple of holes in the boat. We've got an increased laminate uh, along the centre line. It's got bulkheads running along the the, the hull, 
so it should be able to um, it, it'll be able to handle being beached um, the other thing that's significant with the way this is set up and it's actually we've done this in line with the Seawind Sea Wind 1600 as well um, some boats have dagger boards which are attractable but then they still have a spade rudder and what that gives you is sure you're able to go into certain areas but you're not you've still got the spade rudder preventing you from going either stern to into the beach or just into more shallow water so when you've got the um if you if you want to you can actually maneuver in nice shallow water with both rudder up and dagger board up you can use your your outboards which are sitting on the inboard side and they're the actual depth of the outboard is probably it's probably similar or within the draft of the midship of the hull so you, you've still got your steerage with the with the, the rudders up and very shallow maneuverability okay okay the um, just to talk about the the rig um, as well as um, sail the rig is slightly taller it's only uh, 500 mil taller than a, a standard 1160 which uh, it is significant obviously because you get that you actually get the height you, the extra sail area you get down the bottom and uh, and that's that's giving you significant additional uh, main but we've also changed the style of the rig as well it's the same section however we've gone to a double spreader rig we've done that in conjunction with the uh, design of um, Joel Berg from All Yacht Spars, who does all of our rig design and, and uh, engineering. We've done it in conjunction with them because we wanted to have a stiffer rig. Because of the increased sail area, we know we're going to be running uh, spinnakers and most likely screechers as an option. Um, it gives us a, a better performing rig. But also one of the advantages you get from a double spreader rig is that you have the ability to sheet your upwind sails on tighter angles purely because the the spreaders are shorter in length allowing you to bring those sails in tighter to the rig so when you when you have that as a combination with the better pointing ability of the dagger boards you then that it goes hand in hand for upwind performance Okay. Just uh, next slide, please, Brent. The other thing that we're doing as, as part of the standard package on the 1190 is trying to really reduce our weight in our standing rigging. Any weight on any boat that you can get from high up is going to give you an advantage for performance. So the boat um, is getting a, a 25 kilo weight reduction by going to synthetic rigging. Um, it's a it's from uh, Kiligo, the guys in the US. You can see here this is one of the um, uh, this is the, the termination of the synthetic capture out, um, and it just gives us a, a much better uh, weight reduction up high. It's they call it the Kiligo uh, the ducks system. Ducks you can get from other brands, but it's a effectively it's a Dyneema material. Um, the First customer is actually optioned to go with a synthetic headstay as well with a continuous line furler. So um, the the furler weight and windage is going to be dramatically reduced on, on this boat one. The first boat is, um, just incidentally, the first boat is going to the US in April, as I said before, and that's going to be on the on the uh, east coast going to Annapolis. Um, it's one of our um, uh, Corsair um, dealers, who's also now a Seawind dealer. This guy's, uh, I think he's actually bought one of every Corsair models that's come out. Uh, he's a, a very performance orientated guy. He has been used to sailing Corsair 37s, the Cruise 970, and he's he's a, a, a guy that's um, probably going to do a good few regattas, so it'll be good to see how he goes with the, with the boat later on this season. Okay. The, the other um, areas to look through is the general arrangement and interior finishes. Um, if you just want to go on the, the next slide, uh, Brent, um, 
Thank you. The dagger boards going through the midship of the boat um, is obviously going to have some impact, and we've managed to manage to reduce that by really pushing them as far outboard as we can. Um, we've got, as you can see in the lower section there, there's a dimension saying showing that it's a 150, 150 mil deep dagger board. And we've positioned that as far outboard so it's not encroaching on any of the walkway space that you'd normally uh, have on a, an 1160. Uh, the port side, it's right on the edge of the, um, <clears throat> the bench space, but it's still outside of that walkway space. So for you guys, if you're used to uh, the interior of an 1160, then um, it's, it's um, very much the same. Um, and uh, in terms of layout, uh, in that midship area. Forward of the main bulkhead, aft cabins and bathrooms uh, are identical uh, in layout to the 1160 light. Uh, next slide, please, Brent. Okay, look, this, um, this is a, an image of the 1160 light and this is very much the, the base to work from in terms of expectation of interior finish. The flooring is the same uh, as the 1160 light. The, the difference that we're going to see is some slightly different interior finishes. This table that we've got in front of us is going to be a, uh, a carbon twill finish, as will the, the, um, the smaller coffee table there. And we've got some smaller carbon finishes in other areas of the boat. So just to just to trim it up a bit, make it look a bit um, bit smarter and a bit more. Uh, edgy like the uh, as we've done on the exterior as well um, the um, again this is um, 1160 light uh, images images and, and this will be the same um, as I said this is the starboard forward cabin so this is not the owner's cabin but this is the um, the second forward cabin and you can see a, a large double berth uh, in that area starboard aft cabin as usual double berth and then we have the um, the owner's bathroom on the port side. Now I'm going to have to apologise a little bit for the quality of the images. Um, hopefully the fact that they're not all in focus for you might actually be a benefit. But certainly you can see uh, on the starboard side here we've got new mouldings going around the uh, daggerboard case. So um, the the case in this image uh, taken is just um, just in, only just got into place. Um, we will be then glassing it entirely um, and then uh, surrounding that with a, a vinyl uh, wrap. So it'll be uh, far less noticeable, obviously, once all the liners and things go in. But what you can see is that we've got a, we still managed to retain a double sink forward of the daggerboard case. To the after the daggerboard case, you've got your stovetop gas burner. Um, which is still in line with an opening window, so we've still got plenty of ventilation by the stovetop. And then um, with the 1160, as we, um, we've got the, the galley down arrangement, obviously, so you've got that inboard bench, which is still available for preparation space. So um, <clears throat> we've, we've certainly not lost um, the ability to have preparation space because at the end of the day, this boat is not an out and out racer. It's still set up so that you can go out, enjoy it with your family, go do liveaboard if you wanted to do, go cruising in comfort. So we still need that working space. The view you've got there, um, we will have shelves going um, between the daggerboard case and the uh, extremity of the, of the deck. So we won't have an empty void there. We'll certainly utilize it for, for, the, uh, for the galley area. Okay, next slide, Brent. Again, this is <clears throat> still um, boat in construction, but it's worth being able to demonstrate to you where the daggerboard case is located. This is as right at the, um, the outboard point, so underneath the lifeline. And remember, the, the daggerboard doesn't come up through the daggerboard case uh, protruding beyond the deck. Uh, we will have a, a cover over that so you can, uh, you can see the daggerboard, obviously but it won't go above the deck height. But it's, it's good that it's tucked out of the way. It's not 
interfering with the uh, the deck organizer the lines running down and there's still a nice broad walkway on the deck to get through up onto the foredeck which is something that we we've always tried to retain on the ceiling products is not having cluttered decks that you you know have as a trip hazard it's still a safe boat okay next uh, slide brent this might be a little bit difficult to to see what we've got on the screen there in the resolution but what we've got is the the targa bar is now a full carbon um, external finish it looks very nice it's um uh, certainly adds a, a nice sporty look to the boat um in the image we've got here it's it's still uh it's actually wrapped up and protected but the guys have done a great job it looks very very nice on the back of the boat um and it it complements the new transom that we've got also you can see in these images that the blue um uh, paint is a is a protection that we use in the factory it's a it's a, a gel like uh, peel off paint to just to keep the surfaces clear but you can very easily see the the revised transom and the extension that we've done on the on the boat so we're going from 11.6 to 11.9 um, you can see at the bottom of the screen uh, th there's the recess in the transom that allows the the rudder case to be hung um, but we've also got a, a much higher um, uh, top side and deck shape coming down. It's, it, it does a couple of things. Um, the transom extension, giving better waterline length, has firstly a performance advantage. Um, the, the laminar flow on the exit of the, um, if you can just go back one, Brent, the laminar flow on the exit of the hull is far improved um, so you won't see the transom squatting down and, and you can have a little bit of hobby horsing on the 1160 um, so we should see a, a, a nicer smoother exit on the transoms with the uh, with the water flow um, we also get the advantage by having a much longer step at the back for boarding to be easier whether you're going onto the dock or whether you're actually just jumping off the back or obviously going on to the tender, which is accessed off the inboard side of the, of the transom. So there's a few advantages there. We also have gotten rid of all of the stainless uh, pulpit and railings. We're going to synthetic guard wires, which again give us, gives us weight reduction. Um, and we can just strip out some of that weight off the back of the targa, we're also reducing our um, stainless steel uh, componentry as well. Again, trying to get rid of some of that weight up high um, and going to a more simple, lightweight uh, construction for the uh, dinghy davit system. Okay. Okay. So. The sail package with the boat that comes standard is is quite comprehensive. You you've got the 61 square meter main, 29 square meter jib, and then you've got 105 square meter uh, spinnaker. We have the option, and certainly the first customer will be getting a, a screecher as well, run off a, a carbon bowsprit. Um, the uh, the sail package is um, coming out of Doyle's. Uh, they're doing some really nice product at the moment. Um, the sail cloth is the um, Dimension Pollen BX15, which, we've, um, which is a it's a pretty high end uh, uh, aramid um, carbon uh, material, very lightweight, and we you know should have some pretty high performance um, uh, as a result of that. So. Um, we can also run a second halyard if requested, so we can then have a, a, a spinnaker and screecher run at the at the same time for guys that want to have a, a full sail package available uh, rather than swapping one one to the other. Okay. The other thing we've done, just talking about sail and and sail handling, is 
We've changed our sheeting system and our traveller system also. Um, sorry, Brent, you can put it on that last slide. Um, the traveller system and sheeting system. So given that we've got the dual helm system, we, uh, we've we gone for a, a main sheeting system that goes to both helms. So um, for some, they'll, it's known as the German sheeting system, but you've got it running as a, a line on both sides. Um, the main sheet traveller, is, uh, is also changed slightly. We've still got the same basic arrangement where it's coming down the port side of the target arch, but it's going down through two jammers and onto a winch. So it just means when you're, when you're uh, jiving or going downwind, you can dump the, the main far more easily than if you were to be using the, the line driver, which typically you've got to, you know, get your winch handle out and drive it down and it takes a bit of extra time. So just a, a bit more nimble sail control as a result. Okay, so as I said uh, at the start, we've got um, the first boat in build at the moment, nearing completion, we'll be um, launching that in, in Vietnam uh, on at the end of April. Brent's gonna be coming over to uh, to our dealer meeting that we, we happen to be hosting at the same time. So I'm sure Brent will come back from that trip with uh, lots of new uh, media photos and video I, I anticipate but we'll be doing some test sailing just locally here in Vietnam and then we're going to pack the boat up uh, ship it over to the US where uh, our guys from the multi-hull source Bob Gleason is uh, is very keen to unpack it and get it out sailing and, and do some of the local events on the East Coast okay great thanks Mike um, We'll, we'll run out uh, any questions now if, if you want to put any questions into the chat box there as uh, we put previous comments in. Um, but I'll just start it off, Mike. Um, it's a really fascinating presentation, so thank you. But uh, can you just explain to me a little bit more about how the rudder system works in the, the recess there? Okay, sure. So the, um, the rudder case is a composite case. Um, and in the where we've extended the transom by that extra foot, we then have a, a, a recess. So it's like a, a V is cut into the back of the transom. That gives a bit of protection to the um, rudder case. Um, we can hang the, the case uh, nice and high. So it's so that means that the rudder case is out of the water. So obviously, when you're going away. Um, you want to be able to, to, to bring your rudder up out of the water and uh, not have any corrosion or growth on that area. Um, and we do that by having that slight recess. It makes it a bit easier. But then the case has then got the, um, the steering arm on it on the inboard side as well. So we want to have all that protected. So the case has a, 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 an arm or an elbow going perpendicular to it outboard. It then has a push-pull rod going forward into the uh, main body of the vessel, of the boat. And then you've then got a, a, a parallel linkage effectively going back to a, a crossbar that goes uh, over the boat uh, to, the, to the other side. So underneath that target bar, which is from that point forward, very similar to a standard uh, 1160 or 1250, the way we've done uh, 150 plus boats previously. Um, we should be getting a as a result of the setup, we'll probably get a, a much better feel through the um, through the steering system than than doing the standard spade rudder arrangement, which is okay. But I, I think on this kind of boat, you want to get a bit more a uh, bit more response and feedback. Great. So those rudders you would uh, leave up in their case, or would you remove them from the case when you leave I'll the boat? You would probably, um, if you're leaving the boat for an extended period of time, you'd lift them up out of the out of the case completely, put them in the uh, cockpit, put them in the saloon, whatever it might be, um, because for your rudder, you wouldn't want to be um, uh, anti fouling your rudder. Um, you'd leave that just as a gel coat. Maybe you'd put a you know a, 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 an amount of wax on them. The dagger board, um, you we would probably put a an anti foul on the on the lower sort of two three hundred mil or so whatever is below waterline, um, but the upper section again you wouldn't 
any foul because you, you're going to be using it um, when it's in the down position. Obviously, you've got water flowing over it. Growth shouldn't be too much of an issue. And then you can you can pull it up and leave the boat without it up. So, but just going back, sorry, uh, just going back to you can leave the uh, rudders in the up position. However, they will protrude and sit in the water um, slightly just because they they need to have a bit of meat in the in the case. Um, but they're not going to be tremendously heavy, but you can um, manhandle them okay to get them out and put them in the cockpit. Sure, great. I uh, just had a question here from David. What size motors are going in the boat? And are they outboards or diesels? They're outboards. Um, the same arrangement that we've been fitting to a number of our 1160 lights. So we've got twin 20 horsepower Hondas, okay? And then on those, we fit a, a high thrust prop. Um, and we've had some, some good results with that. The, the, um, we've done, I think, uh, probably four boats now with those motors and, and there's plenty of power there. Um, if we wanted to, we could go up a size like we do on the 1160 lights. If people want to, we can go up to a, a 20 high, 25 horsepower Yamaha. But the additional weight of those Yamahas is considerable. So. Um, it really depends on what what you're trying to do and, and what you're using the boat for. But if you're if you're looking for performance oriented sailing, then the the Honda Twenties are, are fantastic. They're great, and they've got a they just for information they've got a um, an electric tilt from the from the cockpit, so um, very easy to to get out of the water and again reduce that drag. Great, great. I got another question. Has there been any thought of a carbon rig? As an <laughs> Look, there's, we, we did have some initial inquiry on that, um, and certainly it's something that we could do. Um, it's just a case of understanding what those costs are involved. Um, but but if um, if there was a requirement for it, easily could be uh, spec and engineered, priced uh, as appropriately required. Great, great. Um, any other questions out there? We've had one here from Rod. Um, any indication of pricing at this stage? Okay. So, the um, in the US dollar uh, pricing, uh, we're on. Uh, it's three hundred and eighty-nine thousand um, US dollars X factory. Okay. So when you then go through, and um, we obviously need to put shipping on top of that, which Shipping from uh, Australia to Australia, typically we're we're looking at around about the sort of the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar US mark, depending on uh, time of year and what's what's going which way. And then we've got to have GST on top of that as well. So um, just roughly, I'm thinking we're in the by the time we've got the GST and the exchange rate done, we're in the the high five hundreds. I think Brent, that's right. That'd be about right. Yeah, and and just to point out too that though there is GST obviously payable. There is no duty payable, and that's because it's a free trade agreement between Vietnam and Australia. Uh, there's duty payable pretty much on every other production cap coming out of Europe and South Africa, so um, mm. just worth noting that. That is significant. But the other option is, and this is something that we've found uh, more and more people are doing, that if, if people have the time and the, uh, and the interest, that the other option is to, to do a local uh launch and pick the boat up from vietnam um sailing in vietnam is, is is a little bit restricted but but what our customers have been doing typically is to shoot straight over to thailand where there's plenty of multi-hulls in fact plenty of australian owned and and sailed multi-hulls um or go the other way and, and sail down to sort of borneo and, and go further uh, further east and down and whether that's to sail and enjoy the boat and cruise for six months to twelve months, let the boat uh, depreci depreciate in value, and then bring it down, bring it into Australia at a later date with a uh, with a lower GST value. That's an option that we've done uh, quite a few of in the last twelve months. And actually, just on that point, um, we'll be uh, developing that a little bit more over the next uh, next little while with. Um, some plans for uh, cruising routes from uh, well around the Asian area there from Vietnam through Thailand Malaysia and and passages back to Australia um, 
and perhaps even a, uh, a coordinated event to bring a number of boats back in company sometime next year. So, uh, so stay, stay tuned on that area. We'll have some more information out soon, we hope. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, anything else you want to share with us, Mike, there? Um, Really no, um, I, I think that's. Um, I think that's um, everything for the eleven ninety. I, I think I'd just like to also add it's that this is very much part of the way that we're trying to develop our our, our product range at the moment. We've got the eleven sixty light. We've had that product out for a few years now, but we're also developing a number of products at the moment, and it's really this is part and parcel of the growth of Sea Wind. We Having been in Vietnam for a number of years now, we've stabilised our production and we're now in, in growth stage again. We've got the 1190 Sport, which is coming out in April. We've got our first uh, 1160 Resort, which is going to be coming out in, in May. That's going down to Darwin for, uh, I think he's a third time or fourth, sorry, fourth time Sea Wind owner, um, which is our second new product for 2016. And then we're also with our Sea Wind 1600, we've got that um, in development and design stage at the moment, due to due to come out later on in the year as well. So it's really great for for Sea Wind and to be part of this process of bringing out new products for Sea Wind again and and uh, and and strengthening the the brand both for Australia and, and globally. Yeah. Just adding to that point, it's probably worth noting, Mike, that. Uh, We'll be doing another webinar presentation, as uh, some of you may have seen, on the Sea Wind 1600 uh, on Wednesday, the 6th of April at 7 p.m. Sydney time. And uh, we'll see the full factory um, VIP tour of that boat as well. Um, so, uh, so make sure you register for that one too. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for that presentation tonight. That's been really informative. Uh, certainly filled a few gaps for myself even, and um, I'm really excited to be getting up there in a month's time to go sailing on this thing. It, it just looks uh, looks incredible. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. Thank you all, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.